coming to paperback and e-readers this April. Isis, the main event. It's carnage inside of a steel cage as the goddess next door steps in the squared circle of his The Beast from the Falls in this all-new Isis series adventure. Get Isis, the main event, this April. I was watching Gonzalo Lira, a.k.a. Coach Red Pill's video on women in the publishing industry. And as I was watching his video on women in the publishing industry and his series of videos on the publishing industry, it put many of my experiences with the publishing industry in perspective. Now, from 1997 to about 2006, I had submitted several of my manuscripts to trade publishers in the hopes of getting a book deal. Now, this has been a dream I have had ever since I was nine years old. I have always wanted to see one of my books on a bookstore shelf, and I've always wanted to see one of my books published by a major publisher. Unfortunately, I didn't know what Gonzalo Lira was talking about back then, because if I knew what he was talking about back then, I would have saved a lot of my money, and I wouldn't have spent so much money and time trying to contact many of these publishers, because it would have been a complete waste of my time. Now, your Gonzalo Lira pointed out something that I already knew, that the publishing industry as related to books is primarily controlled by white women. And because it is primarily controlled by white women, they only want to see books that feature a certain narrative. Now, this was something I didn't know back in 1997, because I thought back in 1997, I actually had a chance of getting a book published, because back then, the black book market was red hot, and authors like Terry McMillan, Connie Briscoe, and Omar Tyree were selling books like hotcakes, but what I didn't understand was that those books were primarily featuring a feminist and gynocentric narrative, and they were all about presenting stories that featured only one perspective, and that perspective primarily was of a single, successful, well-educated black woman who just could not find a man, and that was the only thing that trade publishers were buying primarily because these white women liked seeing black women being downtrodden and having to struggle for anything in this world. Because when it comes down to white women, oftentimes the only narratives they want to see featuring black women are them having some sort of hardship or being placed in a position where they are presented as the victim the way your Terry McMillan presented black women as the victim in her novels Mama and Waiting to Exhale and not really giving us any sort of objective perspective. Now, when I wanted to do with book publishing is I had this mission since I was 17 years old and what I wanted to present was positive stories about African Americans and I wanted to present positive stories about the African American experience and I wanted to present diverse stories about the African American experience, something I knew we weren't getting from the publishing industry, and something I thought people would want to read. Unfortunately, when I tried to query for my first novel, The Changing Soul, back in late 1997, after I got the book Writer's Guide to Book Publishers, Editors, and Literary Agents, written by Jeff Herman from Barnes & Noble, and I started using that directory to query publishing publishers, editors, and literary agents back then. I didn't understand why those publishers were rejecting me. I just thought it was part of the process. But after listening to Gonzalo Lira, I'm starting to see why those publishers were turning me down and these literary agents didn't want to represent me. And the reasons why I believe they didn't want to represent me is because, one, I was a black man and your publishers, editors, literary agents, they're all white women, and many of those white women don't believe a black man can write very well, and two, they didn't want to see a narrative presented from a heterosexual black male perspective, because in addition to many of these rich white women being white women and only wanting to see 
black women's stories, in most cases, they didn't want to see the counterpoint presented from a heterosexual black male perspective because they just don't like seeing that narrative presented because when a heterosexual black man is presenting his viewpoint, he's oftentimes presenting a counterpoint to most of the views out there. Now, the black book market, again, was primarily controlled by white women, and it was marketed through things like Essence magazines and your Oprah Winfrey's, and again, they only wanted to see the narrative of the single, successful, well-educated black woman looking for the good black man, and those stories oftentimes featured a no-good black man who was a player, who was a dog, and then they featured the so-called good brother, who was this beta male, who was pan pandering and begging for this black woman to notice him. And eventually, by the end of the story, she realizes that the guy is a jerk and then goes over to the beta male, and they have live happily ever after. Now, me, as a black man and a heterosexual black man, I was representing somebody who was not going to tow their party line. And this was one of the main reasons I believe I had a hard time trying to launch my first book, The Changing Soul, because The Changing Soul is the first John Haynes story, and it was a story about a black man trying to break free of a vicious cycle of self-destructive behavior and move his life forward. And I didn't know at the time, back in 1997, when I started launching the query letters, that this was a book that the publishing industry frowned on because the publishing industry, again, controlled by white women, they only wanted to see stories about victimized black women. And me, being a college-educated, heterosexual black man, presenting a story of an intelligent black man in the pages, that ran counter to the narratives they were presenting in many of these novels about these single, successful, well-educated black women. And me presenting my story of John Haynes being stuck in this vicious cycle, having to deal with a predatory ex-girlfriend, and dealing with the things that were keeping him from moving his life forward, that ran counter to many of the gynocentric and feminist narratives presented in most literature on bookstore shelves at the time. Now, there were guys out here publishing books like your Michael Basden, who at the time was publishing Men Cry in the Dark, but he self-published that book because he ran into the same brick wall that I ran into as related to getting a book deal. And your Michael Basden, then after doing Men Cry in the Dark, came out with a book pandering to women called The Maintenance Man, soon after. So he got right in line with the gynocentric narrative soon after he came into the publishing marketplace. And he wasn't really interested in doing what I wanted to do with The Changing Soul, which was trying to reach young black men and present them with a positive role model for black manhood and black masculinity. And again, I didn't know at the time that that type of narrative was frowned upon, and I didn't know that I was the reason why I was getting so many rejections. Now, I had contacted one, the Holloway House, back in the day, which was considered to be the only publisher that specialized in African-American books, and they had told me that it was interesting and to wait and come back to them, but then when I came back to them, I got a hostile response saying that, oh, there are no books for black men, black men don't want to read, and that if black men want to read, they can go ask a clerk in a store for books. So that showed me, again, how your publishing industry is extremely hostile on the idea of buying and selling books that are targeted towards black men and want to present positive images of black men, balanced images of black men, and humanized images of black men. Now, while I was working on The Changing Soul, I was getting it finished, I also was working on the first ISIS around 98, 99. And ISIS came together very quickly. And, excuse me, I wound up sending out queries for ISIS, and the rejections for ISIS were actually worse than they were for The Changing Soul. Now, the ISIS had 
again, was a great story. People loved that story when I published it finally in 2002. But most of the fantasy publishers out there, there weren't that many, they quickly turned ISIS down because they just did, weren't interested in publishing African-American fantasy fiction. Now, according to these publishers, there was no real audience for African-American fantasy in 1999, nor were they interested in creating an audience for African-American fantasy in 1999-2000. And that was one of the reasons why I chose to use Isis as the first book that I would go out here and publish with a print-on-demand publisher and in 2002 because I just didn't want the script to just sit in a box. I thought it was a great script and I wound up publishing it with Virtual Bookworm back in 2002 and again when I sent that book out to different book clubs and different people it got an extremely positive response but the people in the trade publishing market they didn't want ISIS on the marketplace again and the reasons why they didn't want it in the marketplace was because they did not want to see a black woman as a goddess because if you have a black woman as a goddess, she is elevated in a position above a white woman. And many of the white women in the publishing industry, they didn't want to elevate a black woman in a position higher above themselves. And two, I was presenting the Egyptian gods as black people because when I imagined the Egyptian gods, I was imagining black actors like Angela Bassett, Samuel L. Jackson, Sally Richardson, um, Shamar Moore, Halle Berry, uh, and Michael Clark Duncan, I imagined them as Egyptian gods, and I was going to do the entire Isis thing series around African American and black Egyptians. So that was something that was unpopular with many of your white female editors and many of your white publishers because they, in some cases, want to perpetuate and promote white supremacy. Most, more importantly, they want to promote white female supremacy because in their publishing marketplace, they want to push mostly feminist and gynocentric narratives, and those feminist and gynocentric narratives are the thing that primarily are the narratives they want to push in the book market, because again, your book market is controlled primarily by white females, and these white females only want to see one type of story from their own publishing imprints, primarily stories of single, successful white women who are looking to get their hands on a rich man. And usually these books like Your Sex in the Cities and books like that, that's the core of most of the book market these days. And for the black women, they usually want to see the black woman as less than. So those are the two books that they usually buy on the regular. Now, I thought that if that's what people wanted to buy, I would take a crack at it, and I did start around 2003, 2004, when I had lost a receptionist job working on another book. This one was a black-on-black -black romance and a love story that was in the vein of the chick lit that was coming out from many of the publishers at the time. And this book, which I titled The Cassandra Cookbook, I eventually published in 2008 with Virtual Bookworm. And this was a black romance that featured a black female baker who was looking to get a business deal for her parents who were starting to retire from the bakery that she and her parents had worked at for many years. And this bit was about a woman who's about to get married, and she soon finds out her boyfriend is on the down low, her fiancé is on the down low, and that sends her life spiraling out of control. And she's trying to do this while she's she's dealing with this as she was trying to, to get this business deal. Now, this book, it got a lot of agents wanting to look at the first 50 pages. It got a lot of people wanting to look at the manuscript. But I soon started getting rejections, and I didn't know why until 2011 or so, when my best-selling author friend had told me that it was because the story I had presented was not presenting the alphabet community in a positive way because the whole idea of a down low character being a bad guy, that was considered a no-no in the publishing industry 
because there were many people in the alphabet community working in the publishing industry and they only wanted to see representation in what they considered to be a positive role as the alphabet best friend and because they only wanted to see the alphabet best friend they did not like the idea of this story presenting a down low man as a bad guy who was looking to use a black woman to advance his career at her expense. So they had an issue with that and that was one of the reasons why the book was being rejected in spite of many author, many literary agents considering it to be an extremely well-written and well-crafted book. And the Cassandra Cook book, again, when I published it back in 2008, got lots of positive reviews from many black book club readers and many readers overall. And it showed me that there was a market for this book. Unfortunately, many of the white women in the trade publishing industry were, were too wedded to the alphabet community to take a risk on this book and get it in the hands of readers or to try to get it in on the marketplace because when I took it to the marketplace back in 2008 it got pos lots of positive reviews from readers and when I repackaged it in 2011 as a recipe for success it got an even more positive response because the book sold over 2,000 copies from 2011 to 2013 and again showed that there was a marketplace for this book and there were lots of black women who were eager to buy this book unfortunately it was denied a place in the marketplace because it did not feature a story that fit the narrative of white women as related to the image of black women nor did it have an author that was a that represented what they wanted to represent which was either a submissive beta male or a, a male who was just a weak male because they liked stories from guys like Omar Tyree and Michael Bayesden that pander to them but the whole idea of a heterosexual black man who is articulate well-spoken and intelligent presenting stories from a male perspective that's something that your trade publishers just don't want to see they don't want to see a masculine heterosexual black man writing stories and they don't want heterosexual masculine black men presenting narratives because it often runs counter to many of the feminist narratives of many of their critically acclaimed works like The Color Purple and Your Push by Sapphire and many of their other books which demonize and emasculate black men and present either black men as brutes or present black men as weak and cowardly because what I didn't understand was my mere presence in coming to the publishing industry as a heterosexual black man that was considered something that was frowned upon in the industry because they usually again when it comes down to black books only either want black women or they want the stories from manginas looking to pander to black women and they really did not want balance as related to the narratives or the stories presented in the publishing industry. Now many of the people who read Cassandra Cook book, they told me that this was one of the things they liked about the book was how balanced this story was and how the story objectively presented all of the action because that was one of the things I wanted to do with this book was give people a balanced picture of black life, give people a balanced picture of the black experience and show you not just the poor victimized black woman but should also show you black men and the things that they have to deal with so that you can come out of the story with a objective view of the black community and the black experience now again when I submitted this book to your trade publishers and literary agents this book got over 400 rejections from your trade publishers and your literary agents and again back at the time I thought this book actually had a shot because people were requesting it it was in a hot genre and people were really interested in it but again it just did not fit the narrative that these white females had for black women 
because a lot of them, they just did not like seeing the idea of, one, a black female being elevated to a high position, nor, two, they didn't want to see a black woman win with a good man because that's something that they want for themselves. So they didn't like the idea of a black woman being on the same level as a white woman. But after I finished Cassandra Cookbook in 2004 or so, I started work on a new John Haynes book, and this new John Haynes book was The Temptation of John Haynes. Now, The Temptation of John Haynes, this was a book that trade publishers hated. Literary agents hated this book. And I got some extremely hostile responses when I went out to submit this book for the query process. And I didn't understand why I was getting all of these nasty and hostile responses from these white women, but now after listening to Gonzalo Lera, I'm starting to understand why white women hated this book in the publishing industry. Now, The Temptation of John Haynes featured John Haynes as he was being tempted by the devil and the she-demon, Esteem, who was recruited to try to seduce him and get him to compromise with her, and eventually that would lead to him losing his soul. And I didn't know at the time in 2005, 2006, when I was querying for this book, why this book was getting such a hostile response. But after watching Gonzalo Lira, I started to see why this book got such a hostile response. And the reason why this book got such a hostile response was because it featured a strong, intelligent, heterosexual black man as the lead. And that was another frowned upon thing in the trade publishing industry, was presenting a strong, heterosexual black man in a story. And to show a black man in a story, again, who was masculine, heterosexual, and in a leadership role, that was something white women did not want to see. And the heroine, Easting, they didn't want to see because she was playing the role of a temptress, and that was something that they didn't want to see either, seeing a black woman in the role of a temptress. They didn't like the idea of a black man being in the lead, and they didn't like the idea of a black woman being in, in these type of roles, and they didn't like the idea of a, a black writer coming in and writing fantasy fiction. That was another thing that they did not like. So that was the reasons I was getting hostile responses on The Temptation of John Haynes. And the, many of these white women, they only, again, at the time, all they wanted to see was stories like your Harry Potter or your Twilight. And they liked those Twilight vampires who sparkle in the sun because they fit their narrative. But the idea of a black man being strong and masculine, a black man being placed in a leadership position like a CEO and wielding power, these are things that white women did not want to see as related to black men and the black male image. If they wanted to see black men, they wanted to see them either in the roles of this bumbling, stumbling idiot, background character, this black brute, this coon. They are comfortable with those type of roles in trade publishing books or side characters, but the idea of a black man being a hero and a lead character this is something that most of your trade publishers don't really like having out there. So this is, these are the reasons why I walked away from your trade publishing industry and I started my, uh, to go out on my own after the Cassandra Cookbook in 2008 because the kind of stories I wanted to tell just did not fit the narrative of trade publishers. So that's why in 2009 I started the SJS Direct imprint with All About Maryland. And the reason why I started it with All About Maryland is because one, this was a screenplay, and two, I was talking about black actresses in Hollywood and the things that they struggled with. Again, another narrative that the white females in publishing just weren't going to tell in the books that they buy. And I was also, again, ran into resistance when I sent this one out to screenplay contests because when they, people started seeing Tabitha Strong, the white female movie star, attacking black Marilyn Marie, that's when you started to see a lot of these white 
people getting defensive and saying, oh, that wouldn't happen, that wouldn't happen. Again, looking to defend the white woman, but not understanding that the story was about the struggles of black actresses and also about the way white females abuse people and abuse situations. And they, and how gynos, and in our gynocentric society, white men will go out of their way to defend a white woman no matter how egregious her behavior is. And that was a commentary I was making in this story. But your publishers and your, again, Hollywood people didn't like this story because, again, it did not fit their narrative. So I took it over to my SJS Direct imprint, and it was the first book that was published under the SJS Direct imprint. And this book was critically acclaimed by numerous black book clubs and even many white women who were, after reading the book, really enjoyed the book and really enjoyed the script. So it showed me that audiences out there would have loved All About Marilyn if it were a movie, and a lot of people loved the book. So they were telling me that this was a great book, this was a great story, and again, couldn't get it to the marketplace because it did not fit the narrative of many of those white women out there and many of those white men in Hollywood because they only want to see a certain story. Now, after I published your All About Marilyn in 2009 and 2011 to publish The Temptation of John Haynes, I then decided to continue pushing the SJS Direct imprint. And the book that I made after that was another book that did not fit their narrative, which was All About Nikki. Now, All About Nikki was a huge hit. This book was an international bestseller, and people loved this book. I mean, this book, which was about a black teenager in Beverly Hills, yet another story that did not fit the white narrative as related to the black image. They would never pick this book up or make this into a TV show because it features a black teenage girl in Beverly Hills, and it features a black teenage girl who is just as wealthy as the white girls and is elevated to a high position, just like the white girls, and was at the time written to be you know, in the vein of shows like That's So Raven, um, Your Sweet Life of Zack and Cody, and Your Victorious, and many others. And this book at the time, in 2011, this was a major hit when I launched it on Smashwords, and a major hit when I put it on digital platforms. I mean, people bought this book up, and they really enjoyed it. And at one time, I thought it was going to get some sort of deal as related to it, but the deal fell through. But it was one of the big hits of the SJS Direct imprint and is one of the better sell best sellers on the SJS Direct imprint. Now, another book I did in 2013 was The Thetas, and this book was also a hit when I launched it online. Now, when I did this book in digital for many years, it was one of those books that people loved. It got a lot of positive reviews. Unfortunately, many of the white females who are part of the publishing industry don't like this book, and many of those feminists don't like this book because it practically denounces feminism and it shows uh, all the flaws in feminism. So a lot of feminists hate this book, which is an inspiring, uplifting, sophisticated sorority story, which gives us black sororities from a black perspective and shows how we value our own culture. And that's something that, again, white females in the publishing industry would frown upon is seeing black women being elevated and presented in a positive light and being presented in a way that shows us our culture not pandering to white people or seeing black women looking to be just like white women and learning to love themselves and feeling a sense of self-worth. A lot of the feminists hate this book and a lot of those feminists don't like the story here that denounces feminism and talks about the role of the black woman as getting back to the role of being a helpmeet and a support to a man. And they don't like this book, again, that for that reason. And they also don't like it because a black man wrote it. Now, many of the people who read the Thetas, they were surprised that a black man could write a black woman so well. But I could write that because I have lots of female family members I live around. And I have been around lots of women, so I could write a story from a woman's perspective and make it fresh because that's just part of my skill set as a writer. I mean, I've written lots of women 
in my in that 10 years that I, before, well, before I wrote the Thetas. And this was one of the, again, a book that was critically acclaimed. People loved this story, but it wouldn't have never gotten anywhere in the trade marketplace because, one, it was written by a heterosexual black man. Two, it was presenting a story from a black perspective that was not feminist or gynocentric. And three, it was a story that denounced many of the feminist narratives that your white women want to push in the black community. But when I took this book to the marketplace, it was a big hit. It sold over a, a 1,500, to I think about 2,000 copies, and it did very well on the Amazon platform and the Smashwords platform. And I had it digital for about a year or two, and then I took it to paperback, and it still did well. So that proved to me that there was a market for a story featuring a black sorority, and there was a market for a positive story featuring a black sorority, but your trade publishers didn't want to put that on the marketplace because it did not fit their narrative for black women, and it did not fit their narrative as related to presenting feminism, because they like, because a lot of the white women there, they love their feminism, and they love seeing black women in a victimized position, and this book doesn't do any of that. Now, other books I have published over the years are books like these in the Isis series, and this is a series that, again, features a strong heroine, but your many of your people in the publishing industry, they don't like the Isis series. They don't like Isis series books because your Isis is a strong black heroine, but they don't like the idea of a black heroine who is not spouting feminist rhetoric. They don't like the idea of a black woman who is intelligent, respectful to men, and wants to go out here and be a goddess next door and a girl next door because white women want to be the girl next door. White women want to be in the position of the girl next door, and they don't like the idea of a black woman being in the role of the girl next door. So they have a, they, a lot of them hate the ISIS series, and a lot of those women in the trade publishing industry hate the ISIS character. And I've gotten them taking swipes at the ISIS character. Uh, I remember when I did Beauty Myth, and those feminists came after me talking about the cover was lousy, and they used that as a way to try to attack the story. And they had issues with the books, and they've had issues with the stories. And I finally figured out um, a long time ago that the feminists had an issue because of the narrative. And Gonzalo Lira's video really put things in perspective for me as related to why I was having such a hard time trying to get books to the marketplace was a lot of the times the books I was querying just did not fit the narrative of these white women. And because these white women only want to see one type of story as related to the black experience, it makes it impossible for a black author to come to a trade publisher. Because a heterosexual black man, if he comes to a trade publisher, they only want him if he's a beta male looking to pander to black women, and they don't want the they don't want a heterosexual masculine black man presenting stories that are presenting a rich, diverse picture of the black experience or a rich, diverse picture of the black community that gives you pictures of black goddesses or black sorority stories or black girls from Beverly Hills or black actresses or a black girl who comes from a family with a father in it and a black works at a black owned business. These are things that your white females don't want to see in publishing. And they also don't want to see, you know, diverse images of black girls in places like the goth subculture, like I did with Spinsterella in 2015 and the legendary Mad Matilda and Spellbound in 2016 and 2017. So they don't want to see these types of stories because they don't fit the white feminist narrative as related to the black image, and they don't fit the stories that they want to see as related to the black image. When it comes down to many of your 
white females who work in the publishing industry, oftentimes they have a very narrow view of the black experience. They have a very narrow view of black culture, and they only see the black community through the lens of only their own eyes, and they only want to hear and see things that validate their ideas about black people. So that's one of the reasons why I walked away from most of those trade publishers is because they only wanted to see one story, and I wanted to tell a diverse array of stories like I, tr like I try to do with most of the books of the SJS Direct imprint so that people can get a richer and broader picture of African Americans and the African American experience because we shouldn't be put in one box and only have one story told about ourselves. And black people come from all different walks of life, all different aspects of life, all different aspects of culture, and we need to see all of those walks of life, all of those aspects of life, and all of those pictures of culture in order to get a clearer picture of the black experience and to get a clearer experience of black culture. That's something I try to do on my SJS Direct imprint. And while many people will say, oh, self-publishing is something you shouldn't do, it was something I had to do because your trade publishers just were not going to give me, give the world these kind of stories because these kind of stories just don't fit their narrative. I mean, all of these books right here, they don't fit the narrative of your white trade publishers who, again, only want to see, as related to the black image, you're either your emasculated beta male black man or your bumbling, stumbling black man, or your single, successful, well-educated black woman who can't find a man. These are the only stories they want to see about black life because it validates white women and allows them to live in their smooth world, allows them to be comfortable in their smooth world, and allows them to feel good about their world because they don't see anybody who can challenge their world or challenge their ideas about the world. So that's the reason why it's next to impossible for a black man to even try to even go to the publishing industry to get a book published, and why many people go out here and self-publish. Now, some people say self-publishing is something you shouldn't do, but again, it's something I had to do because the trade publishing marketplace has been very, very discriminatory against black people, as I see it, ever since the 90s, and because they don't want to see stories by heterosexual black men or black women that run counter to their narratives. This is what makes it makes people go out here and self-publish, because they want to tell stories about the African-American experience and the African-American community that just aren't told by your mainstream publishers, and they want to give people a richer and clearer picture of black culture and the black experience that you would not get from many of your mainstream publishers, which are ran and controlled by white women, who want to see white women on top, and see white women as the ideal, and see white women's narratives and perspectives as the only stories out there. And when it comes down to the black community, this is very detrimental to us because a white woman should not be controlling our narrative in literature because when white women control our narrative and literature, they control our image, they try to tell our stories, and oftentimes they tell our stories wrong because we only get their stories through the lens of your black feminists, and a lot of times your black feminists often give us parrot the same white supremacy to readers all across the globe and validate many of the same racist stereotypes about black people that are detrimental to our community and promote the worst images of black people. So that's why it's important for people to go out here and support books like those I publish on the SJS Direct imprint. All of these books give you a more balanced and humanized picture of the black experience. And again, you get a diverse picture of the culture. 
you get a diverse picture of our experiences, and you get to see black books in genres like African American fantasy, science fiction, and you get to see a writer who can write in a range of different styles, from the novel to the screenplay, and can write fantasy, and again, I wouldn't be able to do this, again, if it wasn't for God helping me, you, my viewers, and people buying my books, and people supporting me, and again, the reason why I do this is because I want black children and black men and women to see a richer and diverse picture of themselves and a richer and diverse picture of their communities outside of the ghettos many white women say we live in and many of the stories that white women present only showing us black women in the hood, black women being abused, black women being um, victimized, you don't get that in an SJS Direct book. Oftentimes you get rich pictures of the black experience. You get to see black girls with fathers in their lives. Something else your white women don't like seeing is seeing a father in a story. Whenever I put a father in a story, that really makes a lot of people upset because when I show stories like um, The Thetas or Spellbound or show you stories like the recipe for success where there's a black father in it that really gets a lot of women upset and again all of these stories they present narratives that don't, white women don't like seeing in their books and these rich white women they have this one view of the black experience and when I go out here and I publish a book it is designed to shatter people's ideas about black people about black culture and to open your eyes to, to a larger and broader world of people you never thought existed. If you want to pick up some of my black fiction on the SJS Direct imprint, you can head over to Amazon.com and pick up many, all of the books on the SJS Direct imprint on Amazon.com in paperback, and you can also pick them up in digital formats on Amazon's Kindle format, Smashwords, and the iBookstore. And if you want to help me be able to make more books on the SJS Direct imprint and put quality covers on them like Bill Walker's Isis from Escape from Transylvania, Isis Samurai Goddess, or the more recent John Hayes, The Man with Nothing to Lose, regular and variant editions, you can donate to my Patreon, my PayPal, and my Cash App by clicking the links in the description box. That helps me be able to hire and pay artists to design the covers for these books and to be able to put books out here that are on the level of many of the books you see in a bookstore. That's all I have to say for this video. You can comment, rate, and subscribe. Coming to paperback and e-readers this March, John Haynes, the man with nothing to lose. The man who rules the world runs into the irresistible force of a man with nothing to lose in this action-packed, all-new John Haynes series adventure. Get the regular and variant cover editions of John Haynes, the man with nothing to lose this March.